We visited the Netherlands recently and had a lot of fun. It's a cool country that lines up well with our interests in cycling and urbanism. And if you regularly watch our channel, you'd probably enjoy visiting too. But while we took home some lessons and inspiration, we did not return home completely depressed about where we live and desperate to uproot and move to the Netherlands. Normally, this is not surprising. People don't usually come back from vacation and plan a move. But there's an increasing sentiment within the urbanist space that North America is doomed or beyond repair, and the only way to live a happy life is to abandon this crumbling continent and move to Europe, ideally somewhere like Amsterdam with better cycling infrastructure. This perspective ignores the real progress happening in our cities, as well as the complex realities of what makes people happy and how they choose where to live. In this video, we're going to explain why we're happily staying in North America instead of moving to Europe. First of all, we just like where we live. Despite being in North America, we live in a walkable neighborhood where all of our daily needs are close by. We have lots of nice, quiet streets that are a joy to walk down. We have access to a reliable rapid transit network with good coverage of the central city, with a new regional metro system that's bringing modern, automated trains deep into the suburbs, too. We have vibrant pedestrian streets that are packed with streetscaping, shades, seats, activities, art, and public performances, which makes them great destinations to hang out or spend time with friends, on top of just taking a stroll or grabbing some food and sitting out on a terrace. We get to enjoy a good variety and concentration of parks, whether we want to have a picnic, bike around, or get away from everyone in the woods. We have a good community of friends and like-minded people here, and family isn't too far away. We are well located to visit other cities and for people we know to visit us. The bike infrastructure here definitely has its gaps, but it's good enough at this point that it meets probably 85% of our needs. We often take trains to other cities, and while we wish they were faster and more reliable, they work well enough to beat renting a car much of the time. We have our complaints about where we live, but are we missing out on so much that we're desperate to uproot our lives and move across the world? Not really. Okay, great, you might say, but you live in Montreal, and that's not representative of North America. No, it's not. But you're not living in North America as some abstract idea or average place. You're living in a particular city, and more than that, you're living in a particular neighborhood. You don't need to save the whole continent to find a place you enjoy living. Urbanists have talked about North America as if it's one cohesive thing, so much that we've given other people, and sometimes ourselves, the impression that we all live in the exurbs of Dallas or something. North America is an enormous and varied continent, with lots of places that are much more urbanist than average, whether we're talking about density, walkability, pedestrian streets, public transit, or bike infrastructure. This is North America, and this is North America. North America is this, but it's also this. Here's one shot of North America, and another shot of North America. Compare this to this. Or this to this. How about this to this? By the way, each pair of shots was from the same metro area, and none were the big cities we usually talk about on this channel. Even North American suburbs have way more variation in density and amenities than we give them credit for, which we're going to talk about more in an upcoming video. One great illustration of differences between cities is a study of car speeds as a metric for pedestrian safety. There was an enormous gulf between more urban cities like New York, D.C., San Francisco, Boston, Chicago, and Philadelphia versus more car-centric ones like Phoenix, Fort Worth, Jacksonville, and Vegas. To group all of these places together under the banner of car-centric North America is wild, and that's not even considering the neighborhood variation that every city has. Overall, if you look at all the metrics urbanists care about, what's hardest to find in North America isn't density, transit, or walkability, it's urban cycling culture and infrastructure. Most cities, even small ones, have inherited at least a few fundamentally walkable neighborhoods, and public transit in larger centers is often nothing to scoff at. Vancouver was an early adopter of high-frequency driverless trains. New York has one of the most extensive rapid transit networks in the world. But cycling for transportation? That's something most cities have only recently started to almost take seriously, and the results have been uneven. It's harder to find consistent and usable bike infrastructure in North America than good transit or walkability. For example, transit service in Toronto's suburban neighborhoods is way better than the bike infrastructure. For whatever reason, online urbanism, and we obviously include ourselves in this, is very focused on cycling. 
That's going to give a more negative picture of North America and a bigger gap with the Netherlands. If you're looking for transit or walkability, you're going to have an easier time. Not only is North America a big continent with lots of variation, our cities are also very clearly becoming more urbanist. More dense housing, bike infrastructure, traffic calming, pedestrian streets, and public transit. It feels like we can't even walk five minutes without seeing a new bike lane or pedestrian improvement in Montreal. Halifax, Nova Scotia now has a surprising number of protected bike lanes downtown, given that I hardly knew what bike infrastructure even was when I lived there more than 10 years ago. Hoboken, New Jersey has become a model for traffic safety. There's some incredible street engineering knitted together here. Senior buildings, schools, daycares, playgrounds, things like that, and that's where we try to target our investments. Toronto is undergoing an enormous transit expansion, from the Eglinton Crosstown to the Finch West LRT, the Scarborough Subway, GO Expansion, and the Ontario Line. Seattle is working on an ambitious transit expansion too, with the Sound Transit 3 plan adding an impressive 100 kilometers or 60 miles of light rail, plus expanded commuter rail and bus rapid transit. When visiting San Francisco last year, we got to see their new bus priority corridors, including car-free Market Street in the heart of the city. Across the bay in Oakland, California, we were impressed by the new design for Telegraph Avenue, with bike lanes, bike parking, patios, better bus stops, better visibility at intersections, and fewer car lanes. These changes are quick-build, using plastic bollards instead of pouring concrete, so they're not perfect. But if you compare the before and after shots, or just walk around the street, it's obviously a massive improvement. We need to emphasize that so much of this stuff just wasn't on most people's radars 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even 5 years ago in a lot of cases. But these changes clearly show the direction we're heading, which is less priority for cars. An underappreciated turning point for cycling in a lot of North American cities is the introduction of public bike share over the past 15 years. For a pretty modest price, $10 a month on a yearly membership in Toronto, for example, you get the ability to take a bike from anywhere in the central city whenever you want, docking it wherever you want, and not having to worry at all about bike theft. Public bike share is amazing for multimodal trip flexibility, and it's the main way a lot of people we know bike around, even though they usually own their own bikes. As for housing, condo towers are going up all across Canada even in smaller cities like Waterloo, Ontario. Five over ones, resembling European mid-rise density, have become so common in the US, from Denver to Nashville to Seattle, that they're being criticized for making everywhere look too similar. These bland, mixed-use, but often residential buildings are the result of a popular construction technique sweeping the nation. Cities across the continent are gradually realizing the insanity of parking mandates. The last thing you can say about North American urbanism is that it's stagnant. Don't get us wrong. North American cities, some more than others, have dug themselves into a pretty deep hole of car-centric design. Housing affordability is also a gigantic barrier to urban living. But that's only happening because there's so much demand for denser housing and urban lifestyles that it's clashing with the old regime of density restrictions implemented decades ago under very different conditions. Remember that there was a time, especially in the U.S., but to a lesser extent in Canada, too, when cities were considered undesirable and the future was in the suburbs. And then in this post-war period that I'm talking to you about now, we had what I call mass suburbanization. New York in the 70s was a pretty rough place. According to FBI sources, the power play for control of New York's five families has just begun. And a lot of older people still associate cities with crime and overcrowding. Younger people see cities differently. They're much more likely to say they'd spend extra to live in a walkable neighborhood, or that higher density housing is better for the environment. They're less likely to get a driver's license than young people in the past. They're more likely to say they like taking transit. These are the preferences and priorities of future voters and home buyers in North America. We're not saying car centric suburbs are dead by any stretch of the imagination. Many people still prefer them and many more will be forced to move there if cities don't fix housing. But a growing number of people are souring on the suburbs. Maybe they grew up there and saw houses inflate in size as families got smaller, or they saw the promise of fast and convenient driving lose its allure once everyone got a car. 
This is a real generational shift towards a more urbanist mentality that feels hard to ignore if we're trying to decide whether to be optimistic or pessimistic about the future of North American cities. The problem, of course, is that change can be slow, uneven, and unpredictable. We're pretty confident that most cities will become quite a bit more urbanist over the next 20 years, but depending on how old you are and where your city is currently at, that might be a long time to wait and fight. We don't think anyone has an obligation to stick around and fix their city when they know, given their life circumstances, that they'd be happier somewhere else. But being at a time and place where urbanist improvements are clearly happening, it's genuinely exciting and rewarding to be able to contribute. Much of what we like about Montreal today was built and fought for over the past few decades by people like Bicycle Bob Silverman and Claire Morissette of the activist group Le Monde de Bicyclette that existed between 1975 and 2000. Things were probably pretty difficult in those days, fighting for small wins like bike parking and seasonal bike lanes. And honestly, we wouldn't have blamed them if they decided to leave for somewhere else that was further along. But we're happy they didn't, because today we get to enjoy and promote their results here as a model for other cities. We think people are right to identify the Netherlands as an interesting and livable country that other places can take lessons from, especially on bike infrastructure and road safety. But it's not a perfect place. They have problems and routine annoyances just like anywhere else. They have loud cars just like other cities, as we experienced on our first night in Amsterdam. They have urban highways. Their intercity trains were amazing, but public transit within cities was surprisingly expensive and not as frequent as you might expect. We liked the car-free public plazas, but if we're being honest, some of them felt kind of underutilized, and they made us appreciate our own city's efforts to make its pedestrian streets and public spaces a lively destination, with art, shade, workspaces, activities, and of course public seating and street furniture not attached to restaurants. Public bike share is something we've come to appreciate, but missed in the Netherlands. OV Feats isn't the same, and it isn't available to foreigners like us anyway. And as people who spend a lot of time walking and biking around, we found that public bathroom availability seemed to be worse in the Netherlands than Canada or the US, and lots of places made you pay, even if you bought something there. We don't bring any of this up to dismiss Dutch urbanism successes, only to stress that Dutch cities are real places with problems and annoyances, like anywhere else. The country gets talked about with an overwhelming positivity that nowhere can live up to. People aren't even trying to mislead. They're visiting or moving there and naturally focusing on things that are new and exciting. But only focusing on that stuff hypes the cities up and gives people the impression that they're quasi-perfect places and you can finally achieve happiness if you can just find a way to move there. One thing that really shows the effect of the hype train is that Dutch cities so often get distilled down into just Amsterdam. This isn't because Amsterdam is uniquely good among Dutch cities. Dutch people themselves will happily tell you about Amsterdam's crushing housing costs or how its bike infrastructure is far from the best in the country. But Amsterdam is the top destination for tourists and newcomers, so it's the city you hear most about. Let's bring this back down to earth. We love walkable cities as much as anyone, but even we can recognize that there's more to life than urbanism. Montreal is a good example of this. It has very respectable public transit, bike infrastructure, pedestrian streets, and medium-density neighborhoods. But it also doesn't have the best job market, depending on your field. It has problems with access to healthcare. It speaks a language you might not know. And it has harsh winters. Should you move here? Maybe. We've definitely encouraged frustrated urbanists in the U.S. and Canada to consider moving to Montreal, but it's not a perfect place for everyone, and things aren't as simple as more bike lanes, happier life. Real life makes you consider costs and trade-offs. It's entirely possible that you'd be happier staying in a more car-centric place, if that's where your family and friends live, or if that's where you have a pretty good job. How much time would you spend on bike lanes or pedestrian streets every day? Probably not as much as you spend at your job. For a few months each year during the depths of winter, we'd likely be happier living in Florida. Moving to a whole different continent is an even bigger undertaking. For us, putting a seven-hour flight between us and our friends and family probably isn't worth it for better intercity trains or a more consistent and predictable bike network. 
And this is coming from people who would love to have better trains and a wider reaching bike network. Urbanism isn't our whole lives. Urbanism is an interest, a preference, a set of policy solutions, and maybe even a community. It should be something that makes your life and your city better, as opposed to an engine for an impossible game of comparison that tricks you into thinking you can't be happy unless you have the best bike infrastructure or the best public transit. North America's problems with car-centric design are very real. But when you look at the bigger picture, we just don't feel like this whole continent is some unlivable hellscape. We live in one of the most prosperous and safest places on the planet. People move here for opportunities, safety, tolerance, and stability. For what it's worth, there are way more Dutch immigrants to Canada than Canadian immigrants to the Netherlands. According to the UN World Migration Report, Canada is the number three international destination for Dutch citizens, after Germany and Belgium, while the Netherlands doesn't show up on the top five destinations for Canadians. By a significant margin, most Canadians who emigrate end up in the U.S. It's not for bike lanes, obviously. It's other things that matter, like job opportunities, universities, proximity, family ties, and a shared language. Realistically speaking, if we were hoping to move to Europe, we'd give strong consideration to France or the French-speaking parts of Switzerland or Belgium, rather than starting over with Dutch or another language that we don't have any background in. One of the most useful things you can do if you want to make your city better is to visit other places to experience their infrastructure, design, and urban culture. Cities would be better places if more people brought back lessons. From the bike infrastructure of Denmark or the Netherlands, the high-speed rail of Spain, the transit-oriented development of Hong Kong, the cafes of Paris, the small streets of Tokyo, the zoning policies of Houston, no, that's not a joke, the automated rail of Vancouver, the suburban bus frequencies of Toronto, or the low-cost transit expansions of Seoul. If one of these places inspires you so much that you just need to move there, that's fair. But if you do want to stick around, and realistically speaking, the vast majority of North Americans are not moving to another continent, we can tell you right now that there are other people in your city or town with a similar vision, and that over the next 20 years you will probably grow in number and influence. We can't promise results for any particular city, but we are confident that our cities overall are heading in a more urbanist direction. And if you do end up moving, you might not have to go as far away as you think. Thanks for watching through to the end of the video. Don't forget to bike and subscribe from whatever continent makes sense given your personal circumstances.